Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this RedGamingTech.com video, we're going to be discussing, as well as analysing, tech news, which, as usual, has popped up the past 24 or so hours. Hopefully, you're having an amazing day. We have lots of stuff to get through in this video. I want to start things out, though, with AMD and the launch window of both the Ryzen 4000 series, aka Vermeer, and RDNA 2, aka RX 6000 because both uh, sets of products will launch in October, at least according to China Times. I'll link, of course, that article in the description of the video. Now, October does make an awful lot of sense, because at the end of September, we will have Computex, assuming there's no postponements because of what's going on in the world right now. Either way, a couple of weeks later would be an awesome time for AMD to release the products because that gives time, of course, for people to pre-order and possibly for a reviewers to get their samples and kind of test things out. So let's say I'm guessing if they are announced at Computex mid-ish October would probably be a good timeline at that however, is without inside information. Either way, China Times are reporting that we will see the products launch in October. And as you are likely aware, Matisse has had a refresh of sorts, which is essentially the same silicon, albeit taking advantage of a more mature process, obviously, slightly higher clock frequencies, but the architecture itself is well, basically identical. So it's kind of a lazy release for AMD. That is, they don't need to go to the drawing board and do an entire redesign of the CPU or anything like that. It's pretty easy for them to release it. And naturally, this means that uh, it's going to be very interesting what AMD chooses to do with the Zen 3 architecture. Because I wonder if... Well, there's a couple of theories. The first is that they're only going to release the high-end SKUs for Ryzen 4000, which I'll presume for this video to be the 4950X, and then later on they'll start filling out the other ones. Or maybe Ryzen 4000 is going to be more expensive, and that's one of the reasons that they're introducing this refresh as a way to basically offer products which have good gaming performance, yes, but for the people who want the bleeding edge highest end performance, then obviously they can go for Ryzen 4000. I'll be interested to see what AMD's strategy is for pricing, quite honestly, if they can also take the gaming crown from Intel. I'm actually testing out and doing quite a lot of uh, messing around with Comet Lake at the moment. And I can tell you the Comet Lake, simply because of the higher clock frequencies and other changes like having more cash, it is faster than the 9900K. Um, my particular sample can hit over 5 gigahertz pretty damn easily with good temperatures. So that's obviously a good a good thing. The thing is, though, from everything I'm hearing, the IPC gains of Zen 3 are pretty damn substantial. I got told that they're in comfortably the double digits by one individual, and multiple other folks have told me that they're at least 15 to 17%, and I've covered this several times in the past with various exclusives. So ultimately, I believe that combined with a higher core clock, well, just you can kind of figure out that they're going to do pretty well in gaming, especially given the unified cache. And I believe that uh, all of these things are going to come together to provide really good products um, for the consumer. The thing is, though, it makes me wonder if AMD are going to be happy to charge a bit more cash for them. On the GPU side, though, things are a bit different because they will be bumping up against NVIDIA. And we all know that uh, Ampere is going to be, at the very least, an interesting product with the RX, um, sorry, the RTX 3080 and its kin apparently having bumped up specs simply because AMD are being very competitive. So I would be very interested uh, how all of this ends up, um, especially with the pricing particularly interested in the GPU pricing, I must admit. I'm hoping that the cards are not as expensive. But we'll get into some NVIDIA stuff in a moment, which may actually shed some light on the pricing. I also want to bring your attention to a Tom's Hardware article. Um, now, I don't normally like to cover... I don't want to say drama, but 
I suppose it's the best way of describing it. And I also don't really like to criticise the work of others because sometimes people have bad takes on stuff. Goodness knows I've made mistakes. And yeah, I, I but I've gotten tagged in this a couple of times and people asking my opinions about it. And honestly, I'm only going to mention this briefly, um, but I will link uh, Ian Cutress, who's had a series of tweets he's plonked on to well, Twitter, and also made a couple of articles about this subject himself, and he's gone into this rather exhaustively. But basically, there was an article that was plonked up on Tom's hardware, and I'm going to read the first paragraph verbatim. Unbeknownst to you, your motherboard may be silently killing your Ryzen processor faster than expected. HW Info introduced a new feature today that the vendor says exposes that some X570 motherboard vendors are clandestinely misreporting key measurements to your AMD Ryzen processors, thus boosting performance. Unfortunately, this tactic is similar to overclocking, but occurs at stock setting. As a result, your chip is drawing more power and generates more heat, thus potentially reducing the lifespan of Ryzen chips and all without the user knowledge. And basically, going over the article, what's essentially happening is that as a CPU is under load obviously the processor consumes a specific amount of power and just basically um, with ryzen cpus if the cpu um, is declaring that it's using less power the cpu itself will think that oh okay i'm good to go i can boost up to higher clock frequencies which potentially could mean that the CPU could uh, run hotter and whatever else. The thing is, though, ultimately, this is, well, I'm just going to be really honest, it's trivial. It really doesn't mean anything. The title of the article, Rise and Burnout, AMD Boards, Power Cheat May Shorten Your CPU Lifespan, I think this uh, article title is a bit clickbaity at best, and Quite frankly, given some people aren't so well-versed in technology, it could well basically freak them out to make them feel like their CPU is going to become a nuclear furnace and blow them up, uh, which is obviously not something that is going to happen. The reality as well is we're not talking about the CPU going from like 1.3 volts to the CPU suddenly being hit by like 8 volts or something ridiculous. This is very subtle. And the reality is, the I would say at the very best, if the silicon does degrade because of additional electricity being plumped into it, it's going to be such a minute amount of difference compared to running it at stock. It would be essentially, basically the CPU will be long past the fact of wanting to use it by the time that the CPU itself actually degrades any at all. Also, the CPU itself does have inbuilt protections, so it's not like the CPU is going to just ramp up and ramp up and ramp up and ramp up and then be operating at like 5 million degrees on your, on your system and then suddenly just melt. Now, obviously, I'm being a bit silly by this, but I'm just trying to really reassure people. As I mentioned, Ian does go into this much deeper, um, and you can check out uh, either his article or his tweets if you do want to find out more about this. But long story short, I really wouldn't worry about this at all. Uh, this is just kind of standard for motherboard vendors. It does not reflect upon AMD. AMD did not obviously um, uh, take part in this. It's what other motherboard vendors are doing. And ultimately, it's just a way for motherboard vendors to try and sell them for boards, to try and crank out as much performance as possible. And there are similar technologies and similar things that are employed on Intel CPUs as well. After all, if you have a really high-end board with tons of phases and all of this stuff, people want to just be able to buy that board and then feel like they've got kind of a premium performance. Now, you can argue all day long whether this is something that is honest of motherboard vendors and perhaps they should, you know, have some type of thing where it's not enabled as default. And that's kind of an argument you could make and I'll let people debate that themselves. But I'm coming at this as don't worry about it. Your processor is not going to be damaged by this. Honestly, I've overclocked tons of processors and put way too much voltage compared to what they possibly should have at stock. 
And certainly if you're being frivolous and you're overclocking manually and you're cranking in way more voltage than what the CPU can handle, especially if you don't have adequate cooling, that's something that can damage your processor. But this is not that. This is very subtle and ultimately your processor is not going to suddenly burst into flames. Speaking of NVIDIA though, from earlier in the video, um, we actually have a new leak of an RTX 3080 cooler design and the heatsink looks, well, interesting, I suppose is the only way of describing it. It looks absolutely ginormous. Basically, several heatsinks, four of them almost basically come together with what appears to be some type of aluminum fin design. And it looks kind of like an X in the center. You can see the center uh, two um, heat sinks kind of come together to form like an X shape. And throughout all of this are massive heat pipes which run through the four heat sinks, obviously kind of connecting them together. Now, the rumor has it, um, and this is from a videocards.com article, that the cooler could cost up to 150 US dollars alone, which is obviously, well, rather expensive, to put it mildly, but apparently the cooler itself most likely could handle up to about 350 watts TDP. Um, and that's the rumor that NVIDIA are cranking up the clock frequencies and all of this stuff, but the power consumption of the boards is also said to be much higher compared to what we had with, let's say, the RTX 2080 Ti. This goes also very well with what I was saying the other day, that uh, there is some feelings out there that NVIDIA could be the hotter one this time around, but then maybe AMD may have to crank their frequencies up as much as possible as well. Ultimately, if you feel your competitor is, well, doing pretty well, you've got a few options. One, you can lower the price of your card as much as possible, or two, you can just crank the clock frequencies and obviously bump the specs up as much as humanly possible. So, 100-ish megahertz, 150 megahertz could give you the advantage in a particular benchmark. And let's be honest, let's say that in one benchmark, and this is just being, you know, pull, pulled out of my butt here, but let's just say AMD gets 72 frames a second at 4K on a specific game, and then NVIDIA, the same settings, gets 75 frames a second. It doesn't matter that that difference is imperceptible. I mean, what the hell difference does a couple of frames a second make? What does matter is that when you're scanning through the benchmarks, you can see, oh look, NVIDIA are on top, NVIDIA are on top, NVIDIA are on top, okay, AMD are on top, AMD are on top, NVIDIA are on top, NVIDIA are on top. And that's all that people really take a look at quite frequently. It's just some people would rather spend an extra hundred bucks, for example, on a card, even if that card only has a couple of frames per second advantage over another. And ultimately, there will be lots of other things which come into this, like, for example, what the drive is going to be like, how about ray tracing support on both cards, like, what's the ray tracing performance going to be like, will we see um, third-party designs which possibly even have higher clock frequencies, especially for AMD, and so on and so on. So it's going to be very interesting to see how all of this plays out. I'd also like to bring to your attention PlayStation 5 listings, which have been, well, absolutely inundating Amazon. There's no other way of putting it. Wario64 on Twitter actually discovered a whole bunch of these, including two PlayStation 5 systems. One is a 2 terabyte model, which has a pricing of 599 Now, if your eyebrow is twitching at that, well, I don't blame you, because that is kind of an odd amount of space for the console to have. After all, we have 825 gigabytes for the PlayStation 5 that we know about, so you could assume that it's just going to be double, and simply because of how the PS5's SSD is created, it wouldn't really be possible to have a 2 terabyte model. Either way, um, it is possible that these are just placeholders, and obviously they're getting ready to put the systems up 
for uh, launch. And interestingly, Nibel on Twitter, I'll obviously link his stuff as well, has discovered several different placeholders for various PlayStation 5 games. And one of those is a uh, Konami game. It doesn't state what the game is. And also, the price of this is like 70 great British pounds. Now, if you don't live in the UK, you may not know how much games here typically cost. And usually, a console game is around the 50-ish mark, depending on the retailer and the games and what edition you're getting. But usually, 45 to 55, maybe 60 if it's more of a special edition that's got, you know cutlery or something bundled it i don't know why the hell i say cutlery but you get my point like lots of cool stuff bundled in then it can be more to like the 60 mark and if it's like a really special edition that's got like a steel case and lots of art stuff with it then it can be like 70 80 pounds but the average like uh retail cost of a game here is just standard edition is like 49.99 so these are obviously way more expensive, which means that at best they are just putting the code, the the entries into the um, into the database of Amazon. You shouldn't really take either the prices or anything else kind of seriously. Uh, but either way, we have entries from Bethesda, Rockstar, Bandai Namco, and I think. Um, it's going to be very interesting because I don't believe the PlayStation 5 is going to go up for pre-order tomorrow. I'm not saying that with privileged information. I just, uh, I think Sony are going to want to keep the price under wraps for now. I don't think they're going to want to announce so early. I think they probably want to see what happens with Microsoft and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe we'll see the console revealed, the pricing everything just kind of blown out tomorrow but i'm kind of thinking it's more going to be the games and then more stuff is held back later on let me know your thoughts on this with all of that said though have an amazing day take care of yourselves thanks very much for watching the video and bye for now